very interesting next panel on ensuring ethical and transparent supply chains. And I have a very esteemed panel with me here. Um, so maybe to kick us off, I know we've got about 20 minutes, so I'm going to make this very targeted, but feel free to kind of jump in and respond to each other. Um, we already talk about tech as being a solution to scope three emissions. We talked about that just now. We're now moving a little bit to the other E of the supply chain, ethical. So um, maybe if we kind of break this up on the supply chain side, so starting from production. Uh, Grant, if you could kind of give us a little bit of that overview across on what is the role of tech across the supply chain in ensuring ethical and transparency. Yeah, sure, great question. Um, so firstly, I think we've got to acknowledge these supply chains are very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, it's not easy, but we can put a man on the moon so surely we can know where our products come from. Um, so the, the supply chains are complex, and I think um, it's beholden on us to use all the tools available. Um, so technology can shine light on the supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, blockchain, is, there's a lot of talk about it. But I think it's using the appropriate tool um, at the appropriate time to be able to, that's fit for purpose. So yep. um, most certainly technology is playing, playing a huge role. Yep. And um, Dave, on the, from the material side of things, and maybe from the like, front end upstream of the supply chain, what role, can you give us some examples of what role technology plays? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So um, for us anyways, when we create new materials, mm -hmm. it's really important that we think about kind of the problems that we're going to inherit whenever we envelop, develop a new material and build a technology and a supply chain that supports that. So for example, we just launched a, a product last week called Biovera, which is a new hide alternative for the leather manufacturers, so replace the animal hide. Mm -hmm. Well, when we developed that and launched that, we've now inherited all the supply chain transparency and traceability challenges that the leather industry has. Mm -hmm. And that means that we have to engineer into our technology. The substrate has to be a certain amount of renewability to it. It has to be sourced a certain way, and we have to be able to trace that. Our proteins have to be traceable as well. And all of those decisions in that process has to happen at the front end of the innovation process. Mm. So we actually do all of that analysis from a sourcing and logistics perspective as we build the product in the process. Mm -hmm. And Adam, from your perspective, of course, you're on the other end of the spectrum, so from the end user, but more from a CPG consumer goods perspective, uh, what role do you see technology playing? Oh, technology is extremely important for a business like ours. We're an online-only, you know, on-demand retailer of uh, fashion and home goods and, and other things. And, you know, that's how we go to market. That's the main channel for our, the distribution of our products. Um, but it's also important for the communication that we have with our supply chain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and really, we couldn't uh, do without it. But I don't want to oversell technology um, you know, it is important to our business, but I think just as important, if not more, is the trust and relationships that we have with our suppliers. And technology will never, you know, uh, take away that type of, uh, you know, human to human or interaction that's, that's uh, you know, necessary. And I mean, we'd like to hear examples, best practices, so feel free to jump in. But can you talk a little bit about building that trust? Well, I think since the, the founding of Shein, uh, which was uh, 10 years ago or more now, um, you know, the, the founders of the company, they started small and they, and they built the supply chain uh, with smaller uh, manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And they had to, you know, both implement it from a technology perspective. They, they are and, and were technologists and you know that's what they studied in school and that's what they knew uh, would work for where we were in the evolution of our economy um, but uh, they also knew that uh, being uh, focused on you know southern China and being there developing those relationships um, enabled us to work with suppliers in a way that is somewhat unique and we do that by, you know, because of the trust and relationship uh, that we have with suppliers, they, they're willing to uh, not have minimum order quantities with us, to, to produce very small um, run sizes, you know, uh, such that uh, we're able to avoid a lot of the waste in production and overproduction that's kind of endemic uh, to the industry and has been normalized over so many years. Grant, I know you do a lot of work on 
Cotton, and in this space also, I'd like to turn to you. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so I agree, Adam, um, a lot is based on trust, but as Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we come in. We independently, scientifically verify supply chains. Um, so, yeah, um, I wish I could share the optimism of human nature that, that we can rely on trust alone, but we can. So um, I think there is a role for technology there. Um, so, yeah, most certainly, it's the same with any, um, any type of auditing practice, whether it's financial statements or whatever, there is a requirement to have that sort of independent, um, really well founded in science or process, independent auditing to be able to, to, to verify what's, what's in the supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, anything to add? Yeah, I think that when, I was curious actually, because your trust but verify thing come and kind of resonated with us. Mm -hmm. um, what we found, whether it's uh, it, the, the recent BioVera or the Biotex products or whatever, is that when we talk to the brands, um, the conversations are nice, but they're wanting to see things like an LCA, mm -hmm. right? Pre preferably an LCA that's actually had third party uh, validation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's allowed them to have confidence in what they're purchasing and, and what claims that they're going to make out mm -hmm. to for their products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think also we're getting to a point, especially in the US and, and EU, where a lot of this is also being driven by regulation, right? We, we are seeing that, okay, there are certain requirements around you know, where the product is being sourced specifically, you know, can you trace it back? Uh, and then also, are you allowed to actually import it? So I'd like to turn over to maybe Adam, I could, I could ask you to start. Given this increased scrutiny, um, how can you proactively ensure that those concerns are in fact addressed before it even reaches ports in certain um, regions? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's critical um, you know, to have partnerships like the one we have with Ortane in order to trust but verify mm -hmm. that uh, what we're doing in the supply chain is uh, that we are acting in accordance with uh, regulations, you know, such as, you know, UFLPA, the and Uyghur Forced Labor Act. And what happens when you find some of these things are not, in fact, verifiable or, yeah? Well, I mean, first and foremost, let me say, you know, we have a policy of, and, you know, forced labor is a zero uh, tolerance violation mm -hmm. you know, for, for us. And in order to monitor for compliance in the supply chain, we really have a, a three-pronged approach, mm -hmm. which then it's, it includes you know, our, our sourcing policy. Mm -hmm. you know, at least when we're talking about cotton, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we require from our suppliers that it comes from you know, either the US, Brazil, India, or Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, then we, we also have a, a traceability system that we've put in place to um, to uh, uh, compile the documents that our suppliers uh, provide to us and uh, demonstrate that we, they have chain of custody, they know where the product is coming from, uh, and they're able to you know, submit those to us and we're able to retain those documents uh, for our own purposes and for compliance with, with the law. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the, the testing program that we've had in place uh, since last year with Oratane where we're testing um, you know, 60 different um, fabric mills, mm. uh, mills that are producing cotton product or cotton fabrics. Mm. Uh, and, you know, we use a, a risk-based approach to identify, you know, which, which mills are the highest risk for us, mm. uh, where do we have the most business, where, uh, where do we need to uh, monitor the most. And we have different levels of monitoring uh, where we uh, have independent auditors go to those mills and sample cotton uh, fabrics, yeah. send it to Oratane's lab. Oratane provides us test results of the origin of those, uh, those cotton products based on the, you know, the isotopic fingerprint that, um, that they've established in their libraries and the sample uh, comparisons. And, uh, and that really enables us to, if there is ever a, a violation of our policies and practices, then we can address them directly with the suppliers and uh, make necessary changes. And I want to also just make sure that the audience knows you can raise your hand, feel free to ask questions. There are some in the room, but I just quickly, on as a follow-up to both Grant and Dave, I guess, um, and as the audience thinks of more questions, uh, are you seeing this more? Who is actually demanding some of this? Um, is it more investors? Is it more businesses themselves? And also, um, like, yeah, who, who's yeah, yeah. asking? Um, um, so look, I think uh, a really good point is, People want to operate from a position of knowledge, not ignorance. Mm. So shining a light on these supply chains, sometimes you find out things you don't want to know. Mm. Um, so the people that come to us are people who do want to know. 
sadly, there's a number of people who hide behind plausible deniability. I didn't look, I didn't know, I don't have to do anything. But people who are our clients are people who want that knowledge. Um, and then you know, we, we work really closely with people in, in how you remediate. So like, once you've got the knowledge, how you turn that into an insight that you can reduce the risk. Um, so yeah, so we see a, a lot of a, a broad range from brands, from retailers, from investors, from regulators, requiring these type of insights. Um, interestingly, uh, a lot coming out of the finance sector, a lot of investors, a lot of funds coming into ESG. They don't want to greenwash their investors, particularly if there's a prospectus out there. The directors have a lot of liability, criminal liability for yeah. misleading. Um, so once you invest in an ESG fund that's investing in companies, you need to know. Dave, in your opinion, more of a carrot or a stick? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's really neither. I think it just yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and we see the same thing. It's investors, it's brands, um, and customers, frankly, yeah. who want to be able to kind of have confidence in what they buy, especially the younger generation. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, can we get a mic to help, please? Thank you. And Ben, next. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is mostly directed at Adam, but could be answered by any of you guys. Uh, Sheehan, as recently as October, was found paying their workers less than four cents per item made with wages being withheld. So as you're talking about various implementation strategies that you're using audits or whatever, clearly there's a gap in what's happening and what's practiced. What do you think needs to happen in order to close that remaining gap? Well, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, oftentimes, or sometimes at least, uh, there's information um, that's um, you know in the public domain or, or information that's put out uh, in, in the media, um, in reports that isn't, uh, you know, exactly what's happening on the ground uh, in, in factories. So what we know about our supply chain is that, um, you know, our, our suppliers are paying uh, not only above the minimum wage to their employees, but above the average prevailing industry wage in, uh, in southern China where uh, most of our production is happening and where uh, that report you're referring to uh, took place. So the, uh, you know, both material traceability um, is important to us. Uh, the uh, conditions in factories, the wages uh, that uh, people are being paid, those are important to us. Um, you know, not to say that there isn't uh, still work to be done. There is, and uh, we're definitely putting forth uh, a tremendous amount of resources to make sure that those improvements are made. But still, oftentimes uh, they are not completely portrayed in the way that's uh, realistic on the ground. Yeah, just a question for me. I, um, yeah, I run discount and voucher code websites coming from UK. And Shane technically is one of our clients for promotion. But thank you to Dave about mentioning the customers, actually. Customers want to know. Because I, our websites are focused towards promoting sustainable shopping. So up until this event, I wasn't able to put Shane openly on our websites because I couldn't explain to UK consumers why the dress is 4.99 or whatever, and national wage in UK is like 10 pounds something. So you know the dress cost less than national wage. Seeing you in here at the event, it's good to see that there is a willingness and transition to go into a more sustainable way. The question is, how do I report? all this amazing data through or, or retain verification and to count, you know, follow from the question from this lady before to my customers. Mm. Like, what's the data pool that I can say, guys, Shane is fine. They're not doing slave labor anymore. How do I communicate it to my customers? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, the way I would answer that is that um, Oftentimes, people see low prices and automatically assume that it's the workers who manufactured that product that are being cheated out of, um, of wages, and that's, that's not the case. Um, in fact, the, the low prices that we're, well, first of all, I, I just, the previous question was about uh, wages, and I explained that you know, the wages that our suppliers are paying are, uh, on average, above the industry prevailing wage in the regions where, uh, where we're producing. 
But also, you know, there's, there's this idea that, uh, like I said, you know, uh, which, which is false, that low prices means uh, labor is being exploited. And what, um, what's important to understand is that the low prices that we're able to achieve and, and uh, sell our products to our customers for, uh, those low prices are achieved through efficiencies uh, and the reduction of waste in our, in our supply chain. The way traditional retailers uh, work is that they base their orders on past seasons and past styles, and they make a, a long-term forecast about um, you know, how a certain product is going to perform. And that results in over-purchasing, over-production, and uh, those, that over-production drives up the price of the product that the customer then pays for. Our model is very different because while we offer a whole lot of variety to our customers, we only produce a small amount of each type of style. So everything that you find on our website may not, I mean, in, in many cases, uh, there isn't any inventory uh, on that product or there wasn't any production yet. Uh, or there's very little production that happened. And until the customer uh, tells us that they have an interest in that product and style and size and color and those types of things, only then do we begin to produce more. Adam, so, sorry, last, yeah. last 10 sorry. seconds. Sure. <laughs> so, so, so prices uh, are often conflated with bad working conditions and um, really we're able to do, sorry I went on. No, no, no. Um, um, we're able to achieve those for many other reasons uh, besides just I'm sure uh, there are a lot more questions, so feel free after. But I did, I kind of wanted to come, come back to yeah. Uh, what you were saying there, um, obviously pricing, competitive advantage, but information generally is considered a competitive advantage, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe Grant, Dave, of course, Adam, feel free to jump in. But as you're kind of maybe looking at other business, what businesses, what advice would you have for other companies? This is a very difficult task. What advice would you have for companies that are trying to collect this information, that are trying to you know, uh, implement certain best practices through the supply chain? Where do they start? How do they scale up? What should they do? Yeah, I mean, so for us, it, it, I would say start early. Um, the conversations take a lot longer than you think. Mm -hmm. um, and in the material supply chain, um, they're very convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, there's not complete transparency all the way to kind of the origin of the material. They're transformed multiple times. Mm -hmm and they don't even have visibility to their full supply chain. So if you want full supply chain transparency, that will allow you to support a, a solid LCA, mm -hmm. to be able to give the brands the product claims they want to make, you have to start that conversation at the beginning when you're selecting your raw material. Yeah, no, I'd echo those comments. And you know, most of our clients um, would do it on a risk base on the materiality and start really early. Um, finding the problem as early as possible makes it far more easy to deal with it and uh, create the remedy, so yeah. But if you're trying to scale this up, so one is start right in the beginning, but say you haven't. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, risk-based assessment based on, um, based on other factors such as ownership of the factories in, in terms of uh, materiality of the, the lines and so forth, so the risk-based um, assessments at the beginning. Um, and then starting, and then um, learning, learning as quickly as possible, um, evolving it. Yeah, just to kind of add to that point, uh, it, we didn't do this, but our, one of our suppliers did, um, and they actually prioritized their products, particularly the bio-based products, and went through the entire portfolio. Mm. Um, and in some instances, they had to actually bridge the gap in information mm. between what one supplier and what their supplier was unwilling to provide to them. So this idea of prioritizing it, catching the big problems earlier, and then really leaning into that. Yeah, Adam? Yeah, and creating strategies which uh, reduce your, your risk. Right? Mm. I mean, when we, when we look at the, our entire product portfolio, you know, we have a substantial um, you know, percent of our products that are synthetics, um, man-made cellulosic fibers, uh, other, other types of materials, mm. and the, the portion, you know, for example, that we're using uh, to, to verify with Oritane, um, you know, that represents a very small percentage, 4% of our products, you know, contain cotton, for example, and that's where we focused for this type of traceability and testing. Yeah, interesting. Catch it early, 
prioritize, fill those gaps. And I think once you said something about like it's like audits, so do those audits regularly yes. <laughs> and, and uh, keep that information flowing. Great. I think that's all the time we have. I'm sure there are lots of questions after, but we'll have a break at some point. But thank you, gentlemen. It was great speaking with you. And uh, we have another session coming up, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.